everyone. My name is Beverly, and I'm the museum assistant at the Sutliff Museum, located in Warren, Ohio. This video is part of our digital Victorian medicine series, A Million Ways to Die in the 19th Century, focusing on some of the stranger and more domestic causes of death in the Victorian era. Although we pretty well understand how diseases are spread today, that wasn't always the case. Different ideas were thought to be correct for long stretches of time, regardless of how hard to believe they may seem to us today. The Victorian era, however, was a period of major findings, innovations, and discoveries, especially in medicine. So these things happening close together led to major changes very quickly at some points. Before we get to the part where we figured out how diseases spread, we have to start by talking about some very old ideas about disease. Miasma theory suggests that disease is caused and spread by bad air, usually characterized by foul smells. So what could infect the air to make people sick? Well, decay of any sort of organic matter, from vegetables to corpses, and even the exhaled breath of someone infected with the disease were to blame. People who believed this theory believed that disease could only be spread through the air. This is an old idea, dating back to the Middle Ages and persisting for centuries. The idea was actually very popular in the midst of the Black Death and, in fact, was the reason for the iconic Plague Doctor mask, as all parts of a doctor's ensemble served a purpose. Now, Plague Doctors did wear clothes to protect themselves from the bad air, but what we tend to think of as a Plague Doctor costume wasn't created until the 16th century. Even so, the mask's design was intentional. The mask's bird-like beak was filled with herbs and flowers to keep away the bad airs. The good smells were thought to keep disease away and protect doctors while treating their patients. A similar practice was adopted by the general public. Medieval people carried nosegays, small bouquets of sweet-smelling flowers near their noses or wore them in their hair as brooches or even tied around the waist with the intended goal of combating the bad smells and staving off disease. The name comes from the Middle English words for nose and ornament, and this practice carried into the Victorian era. This later version of the bouquet consisted of scented herbs, often rosemary, thyme, and rue, and were exclusively carried near the nose, usually in some small tapered ornamental vase. Both the vases and the flowers carried in them went by the same name, Tessie Mussies. Although they started as a disease prevention measure, the giving of tussie mussies became a courting practice, invoking the popular use of flower language to send messages in a time when it was very hard for an unwed couple to find time alone together. Even today, both tussie mussie and nosegay refer to particular styles of bouquet. Here's the thing. Even though miasma theory was incorrect, it actually led to some good changes that benefited individuals as well as society as a whole. Florence Nightingale believed in this theory, and she used it to argue for making hospitals clean, fresh, and airy. Due to her contributions during the Crimean War, she was hugely influential in the field of nursing, revolutionizing the practice and making the nurse a highly trained position. British lawyer and social reformer Edwin Chadwick's 1842 report on the connections between poor living conditions and lowered life expectancy and disease was based primarily on the miasmatic theory of disease, and that report led to the, some of the first public health legislation in 1848. It also contributed to some movement towards general cleanliness and the understanding that being around decaying material can cause problems for people. It even eventually led to the understanding that microbes cause disease, pushing us closer to the germ theory of disease. The push for public sanitation based upon this theory was a much needed one. There's no doubt that cleaning up the visible filth benefited public health immensely. That being said, these benefits were outweighed by some problems caused by belief in miasmatic diseases. One such problem was the neglect of sanitation in the winter. Additionally, this approach to disease led doctors to not wash their hands between patients because disease could only be spread through the air, not from one patient to another by their doctor's hands. This also influenced attitudes on bathing in the Victorian era. Kate Armstrong, host of the Explore Us podcast, explained that the common belief was that bathing stripped the body of its naturally protective oils, potentially allowing bad air to infect the bathed person with no natural barrier to disease. Conversely, medieval Europeans actually had decent bathing habits between beliefs in keeping dirt off their skin and the popularity of bathhouses. Deep, even physical divisions of social class during the period did nothing to lessen belief in miasma theory. The majority of people did not live on the privileged and clean side of town, or even in the suburbs. 
Rather, they had to survive in the city slums, whether they were in London or Glasgow or one of America's big cities. The cramped and dirty conditions most workers lived in due to increasing industrialization only encouraged the spread of disease. Places occupied by the rich tended to be cleaner and therefore better smelling than those occupied by the poor. If more poor people died of diseases than rich people did, it was because of the bad air in that part of town. And continuing to keep the more affluent areas clean while doing nothing anywhere else perpetuated this cycle. The main prevention method for the spread of miasmatic diseases was quarantine, something that works for diseases that are actually spread through the air, usually by respiratory droplets. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work for every disease. We know today that diseases aren't just spread through the air. They can spread through surfaces we interact with, the food we eat, and even the water we drink. This idea that diseases can be spread by touch or through contaminated objects rather than simply through bad air is the basis for the contagion theory of disease. Those who believed in this theory stressed that objects people, especially sick people, come in contact with could carry infection and potentially make others who come in contact with those same objects sick, focusing more on the harmful things we couldn't see rather than the ones we could. This idea can be traced back even to Galen, a Greek physician living in the Roman Empire in the 100s AD, but it wasn't popularly accepted until the mid to late 19th century, even though there were individuals who believed in it before its widespread acceptance. Proving it correct over miasma theory saved countless lives and led to even better changes in how we approach health. Part of the resistance to this theory's adoption came from pushback from doctors, who were insulted by the notion that their healing hands could actually be making patients sick, even though they weren't washing their hands between patients or after performing autopsies in the morgue. Blood and gore on a doctor's hands and white clothes was a sign that the doctor was busy, and that was a good thing, even if it wasn't sanitary. Change was coming to these practices, even though it took some time to get there. We're going to discuss a lot of individuals in a short amount of time here, but their contributions all build on each other towards our current understanding of disease. We'll start with early obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis, called the savior of mothers. After noticing that mothers who went to doctors to deliver their babies died of puerperal fever more frequently than those who chose to go to midwives instead, he realized in 1847 that cleaning one's hands before a delivery greatly reduces the number of maternal deaths, and he later applied this idea to surgical instruments as well. Although these practices saved lives, his ideas were largely misunderstood and unrecognized until after his death. Our next major contributor is John Snow, who became involved in a major cholera outbreak in London in 1854. Cholera outbreaks weren't all that uncommon during the period, with America suffering three waves between 1832 and 1866, and the 1854 London outbreak led to some important discoveries about how diseases can be spread. Snow noticed that the outbreak seemed pretty localized to one part of Soho, so he plotted the deaths from cholera on a now-famous dot map, narrowing the source of the spread to the Broad Street water pump. Once again, though, it took time for these ideas to be accepted, but Snow was not discredited for his findings. Instead, he developed anesthetics and was an anesthetist to Queen Victoria during the birth of her last two children. While his career was not harmed by his discussions of disease, his ideas weren't really understood until five years later, but we'll get to that. For now, we need to talk about the Great Stink. The Great Stink happened in the summer of 1858, and was in part due to the poor understanding of sanitation at the time. The Thames was used as a dumping ground for all kinds of refuse, even corpses and sewage. This use of the river made it disgusting in a normal year, but the hot summer of 1858 made things so much worse, with the heat itself worsening the smell, as well as drying up the river somewhat, decreasing the amount of water to dilute the smell, and drawing more heat on what had remained. Members of Parliament were genuinely concerned that the smell would kill them. The disgusting conditions that summer led to the development of a complex sewer system in London to drain the sewage out of the river, designed by Chief Engineer Joseph Bazalgette, much of which is still in use today. This solution to a different problem also helped shed some light on how to deal with cholera epidemics in other parts of the city, as well as transforming sanitation and health in London. Finally, in 1859, Louis Pasteur's germ theory changed medicine forever, proving those who had argued against miasma theory for so long correct and legitimizing the claims Semmelweis and Snow had made about how diseases are spread. Contagion theory was close, and it was a good step in the right direction, but germ theory is the way we understand diseases and how they are spread today. While the discovery did not immediately change popular understandings of disease or completely eliminate miasma theory overnight, it was a step on the path of overall improvement in medicine from approaches to public health to vaccines. 
Pester's discoveries weren't the end-all be-all in medicine by any stretch, and many scientists built off of his work. Joseph Lister went down a similar path as Semmelweis after reading Pasteur's findings. He implemented the use of carbolic acid at multiple points during surgery to reduce infection. From cleaning hands and instruments to soaking dressings used to dress wounds post-surgery, Lister's discovery from his 1865 experiments increased the chance of surgery patients' survival and led to the development of aseptic surgery. Again based on Pasteur's germ theory, Robert Koch grew bacteria in a lab setting and tested them on animals to determine what germs caused certain diseases, eventually finding the germs for 21 different diseases. Not only did his work build on Pasteur's, Koch's discoveries allowed Pasteur, among others, to develop vaccines to fight these diseases. Koch started his work in the late 1870s, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1905 for those discoveries. Although the idea that contagions cause disease has been proposed even in the ancient world, it took a series of discoveries close together for people to understand how diseases actually spread. The Victorian era, for all its strange solutions and causes of death, was a time of rapid discovery and advancement that led to greater understanding of how the world works. If you like this video, check out the others in our series, A Million Ways to Die in the 19th Century. If you have any questions, feel free to call or email us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on social media for more facts about the abolitionist movement, the Victorian era, and of course, the Sutliff family. Thanks for watching.